Okay, so this was the weirdest thing when I when I said that the board is green, the scent is go, mm-hmm. and then you said the sky is calm. For the life of me, because of Subi's accent, I've never been able to tell what she's saying. Like it's the great <laughs> mystery of I don't care about the Jardin, I don't care about f- fuck all that. The great mystery of Mass Effect Andromeda is what the hell does Subi say when you're going down onto a planet? I could have sworn it was Sky is Calm, because like, I play with subtitles all the time, so I think that's what she said, but... Oh, you have no idea how happy I am. I hope that's it. <laughs> Watch it be something, like, completely different. <laughs> okay, we need to have a quick powwow about names, because we can't have a second episode and just be like, welcome to generic podcast. Can't we? Can't it just be, like, parents who don't name their kids until a year after, <laughs> until they're one year old? <laughs> Well, they, they do that, so if the kid dies, no one gives a shit. So, like, oh. <laughs> that's the reason why they do that. We don't want to oh, have a man. podcast that no one gives a shit about until it dies. Ah, yeah. oh, you went to a dark place. I, I wasn't thinking, like, <laughs> I wasn't thinking, like, third world country. I was thinking, like, hippie, hippie parents in America who do that. You went to, like, another... <laughs> You took it to another level. <laughs> I did not even think of hippie parents. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh... Uh, it's because I okay. work with terrible, deep, depressing things. That's what happens to my life now. Uh, so, uh, number one, uh, our podcast child is not going to die. And number two, <laughs> we're not hippies. So, or I'm I, not. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. My husband has long hair and I make fun of him for it. But after that, I don't think we have, we're hippies. Oh, long hair, Rod. That's not his. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's a fantasy role-playing character. He's not a hippie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he likes that lumberjack look and all that. He was really upset when man buns became in style. He's like, I did it first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, podcast names. Um, all right. Names. We're doing this. Okay, let's, let's just do... Um, we, we just need to make an executive decision at this point because uh, like, we're never going to find something we love. We're just going to have to stick with it and then regret it for the rest of our careers. I think this is just where we are at this point. Oh, that would be such a great story. Like every podcast, when we do the intro, we go, just for the record, we hate that name, but we can't come up with anything better. That uh, I, let, Let's just do that. So which one of these have you not hated so much that like you're not going to cringe every time you hear it? Uh, like, did we like, find it? Uh, mm-hmm. Did we talk about the Nexus as as a name also, possibly? No. My only problem with the Nexus is that, like, uh, there's a whole modding thing with the Nexus. Oh, that's right. So. How could I forget that? I spent, like, half of my gaming life is on Nexus mods. <laughs> same, same. Um, what's the one that I hate the least? Probably Splitting the Veil. All right, let's go with that. Welcome to Splitting the Veil. <laughs> we came <laughs> up with the name. <laughs> it took that's... us, like, what, 13, 15 minutes here? Uh, it, well, it took us three weeks if you really get into it. That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's it, right? That's the start. Let's not even try and do an introduction. That's the start. I think I think so. If you agree, we, we should just start there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm Jordan. I have a channel called The Exalted March where I do kind of like long form analysis of Bioware games. And I'm Katie. I'm from Guild Thalen, and I only do Dragon Age lore uh, on my YouTube channel. And you can also follow me on Twitter and maybe sometimes I'll tweet something if I'm feeling like it. But anyway... Should we just jump on into the topic? Yeah, I guess uh, give people the heads up of what we're going to talk about today. All right, so I think what our what we wanted to do today is kind of talk about Mass Effect and Andromeda, and I I think going into it, we really wanted this podcast to talk about like two different sides of an issue and then like come to an agreement on it. So I think uh, maybe in the future we might do something more in game lore. Perhaps for this one, do more real world. And is in Mass Effect Andromeda a shit game or not? What do you think? Oh, I mean, I think um, I think it was my onus to kind of want to do this topic was really just because it's like the number one or one of the number one things that the Bioware community is talking about, right? Like we did the first mm-hmm. episode, we thought it was appropriate to talk about Anthem and to talk about what our hopes are for Dragon Age 4. Mm-hmm. And then we were, we were going to do the whole um, in-universe discussion of mages and Templars and sort of how free mages should be, which is a great topic. We'll probably do that at some point. But I just thought, like, well, what are people actually talking about the most within the Bioware community? And it really is and has been for the past three months. It has been all about uh, Mass Effect Andromeda. So I thought that that would be a good topic to kind of, like, put our our resume, so to speak, so everyone kind of <laughs> knows where we stand on the mm-hmm. very big issue of what did you think of Andromeda? Because there's no mm-hmm. Bioware community person who has been able to escape the... You need to you need to tell me now. What did you think of Andromeda? Because there's very strong feelings on both sides. 
you, you have to cl- clarify your street cred because otherwise, you know, you're not going to be accepted into the Bioware community. You have to change yeah. your game. You got to fly your colors like OG Trilogy or uh, Andromeda. So um, I don't know. Did you want to go first or did you want me to go first? Um, I mean, I could go first. Um, so I I think overall I had fun with it, but I do think it was a really flawed, flawed game. Um, I have like a whole bunch of points that I can talk about on my issues with it. You want to just bomb that all out? Yeah, I guess we can both just do our general overviews and then we'll kind of okay. drill down. So I my biggest issue with Mass Effect Andromeda was actually the characters of the game. Um, I thought like overall, a lot of them were like too young and a lot of them I just wanted to punch in the face. I Every Bioware game I have played so far, like there's usually one that I'm kind of like, eh, I don't really like them so much and then I grow to like them. But then Mass Effect Andromeda, like I wanted to punch PB in the face the entire time and that <laughs> did not change. Every time she spoke, I just wanted to like kick her out of my boat. And like, I know you like Suvi a lot, but I, and like, she's okay. And I thought she had a good character basis, but she's so stupid. Why are you licking a rock? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just got the feeling she had just gotten her, uh, you know, her bachelor's in biology or something. And now she's like, I'm going to go out and do science. Like, I have a bachelor's. You don't do shit with science. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and she's the science officer. She's in charge of science on the Tempest. Yeah, I think it would have been much better if she was just like, maybe like, um, oh, what's the doctor's name? I, it's blanking out of my mind. Uh, Eridana? No, N- Natalie Natalie uh, Dormer. Oh, God. Oh, to, uh, Lexi Tapero. Yeah, if, if she was Lexi's um, like assistant, that would have worked out really well. But I think as this main science officer, just it didn't work in my mind. Like, th- was the rebellion so bad they had to get a whole bunch of, like, fresh-faced newbies to, like, do your crew? You have a very important job. I don't know. I have a lot of feelings about <laughs> that. Oh, the haters, the haters on Andromeda would say Bioware Montreal is the B-team developers and Suvi is the B-team science officer. <laughs> it felt like it, though. Like, but, like, overall, though, I liked Suvi. PB? I don't know what's wrong with PB. She just... I hated her... <laughs> I just, I've never <laughs> felt so much hate towards a character. Before. Wow. <laughs> I like I like Vivian more than I like PB. Something about PB, I just want to like strangle her. I, I, when during her loyalty mission, there's like a chance to say like PB, like mad is the smallest word I can say right now. And th- I, I'm glad they put that in there because that was what I was feeling at the moment. <laughs> Now, do you do you you said you liked Vivian more? Do you generally like more serious characters, or like I always find the good analog is how did you feel about Sarah in Dragon Age? See, I, I I was annoyed by Sarah when I first met her, but then I grew to really like her, and now I like see her as like you know as a little daughter character. I'm like, oh, you know, like, we'll get better, you know, we'll do the thing, like we'll help you grow, and I actually really liked her. But then PB just doesn't have that personal growth, and she just always stays like this fake assholeish roguish character <laughs> and like every time she does something i just like uh just get off my ship just get off the tempest you already wasted an escape pod just go waste the other one <laughs> um okay so character is not one of your favorite things um no. was there any was there anything else for your overview you wanted to point out um like other than like glitches i think my biggest thing was the character creation because mm-hmm. i think yeah. the character creator that they did was worse than dragon age origin and that came out like 10 years ago. <laughs> so it's I, I think its biggest problem was that you couldn't trade out facial features and then you were stuck with the face mask. I think if they just were like, oh, let's change out like the this different eye shape, this different nose shape. Like it, the fact that pretty much all the heads look the same, no matter how much editing you can do, I think was a really big shot in the face there. Yeah. You know um, what's interesting um Kind of, if if um, if I just want to make sure, you're is that mainly what you wanted to do for your overview? I don't want to cut you off. No, that's that's basically it. Yeah. Um, so I think what's interesting about it is my thoughts on it are almost the opposite of yours on the characters. <laughs> okay. And so that's really good because I mean we talked about this when we were planning out the podcast that we didn't want to do like a direct debate because we didn't think that that would be good. But I think mm-hmm. our contrast is going to be really interesting on this topic. Because mm-hmm. when I think of Andromeda, one of the things that I, I felt that they did best, and we'll, and we'll get into this as we as we drill down into the topics more, is that I thought on certain characters they've really improved 
kind of like the formula. Mm -hmm. Um, My example is always with Drac. I feel like Drac has scenes that really showcase, like it's like the quintessential story or it's the quintessential essence of what a, what a good Krogan character can be. Yeah. Um, I did like Drac. And so I think, I don't know. I, I really found that I like the characters and on the, on the fact that they're kind of like um, younger. Well, I don't know. I'll, I'll get into that in a second, but I would say overall with Andromeda, I loved it. I mean, my, my general mm-hmm. view is that I loved it. It absolutely has flaws, especially as I'm going through it now on my sort of second, sort of third playthrough. It has pacing issues. It has very significant pacing issues. I've really noticed that the Havaral Vold section is mm-hmm. easily the weakest section of the game. And I think that the people who are saying, I'm on my second playthrough and I can't get through it, it's almost universally they're stopping at that moment uh, mm-hmm. shortly after you make contact with the Angara. So it definitely has pacing issues. It definitely has flaws. So I definitely think it's, you know, it's the biggest game that they've ever done. It's the fidelity is probably better than in any of the, uh, the games in the trilogy. Cinematically, it is mm-hmm. su- it's superior. It's not even close. I mean, the, the cinematic language, and I'm going to do a video kind of breaking down cinematic language in the trilogy and in Andromeda. It's world class higher in Andromeda. And for maybe a lot of people, that doesn't matter. Uh, but mm-hmm. for, for me, it's really important. Um, so I would say, yeah, I would say characters I really liked and I, I universally, I know people really don't like this opinion. I universally think that Ryder is a better character than Shepard. Um, so yeah, my, my, my overview on it was it has tons of flaws. Uh, most of them are technical. Some of them are, yeah. prob- some of them are probably limited by the fact that we now know in development, they had to keep re they had to keep rescoping and they basically had to restart twice in a five year development cycle. Um, so a lot of thoughts aren't fully fleshed out, but I love, I think the core of what Bioware is good at, which is making a team that you care about. I think that they've gotten better at that. Um, and I think they've gotten better at creating a protagonist that feels more like a person and, and not just like an eighties action star. Uh, but I love eighties action stars too. I get that. Um, so yeah, no, I, I think that that my, that's basically my overview is that I loved it despite its flaws. And then I think we should I think we should start drilling down into the characters because I feel like that's where we're going to get the most mileage out of it since you since you do not like as many of the characters, <laughs> and I do. But here, here's a thought, right? So like if we're going to try right. and if we're going to try and like devil's advocate or try and meet in the middle somewhere, um, maybe you can talk about the character you liked the most, and I can talk about the character that I liked the least. Okay. I I think the ones that I liked the most were pretty much all of the aliens minus PB. I thought Jaw was great. I thought Drac was great. I thought um, Vetra was great. Um, But I think all of the human characters were kind of on like the weaker end. Jaw, not Jaw, Jill, like kind of creeped me out a little bit. Um, Especially with his connection with uh, Jill. Something with that like was kind of weirding me out and I don't know why. Um, Then... Liam, like, I, I was okay with Liam. I know a lot, my, my husband, he hates Liam. Oh, he no. wanted to, like, <laughs> kick him out, like, for the war crime, like, in the very first part of the game. He's like, no, that's very unprofessional. Why would you do that? And he was, like, really annoyed by that. Um, I thought Korra was fine. I honestly, I 100% thought there was going to be some sort of subplot where, like, Korra had a crush on your dad and was trying to, like, overcome that. I don't know why I got that feeling. <laughs> I got that feeling too, and I really wish that they had gone with it more. And if you think about it from that perspective, if you romance mm-hmm. Cora, that gets really creepy. Yeah, that would be really creepy. I'm glad I'm not the only one who totally thought she had a thing for your dad, because that was, I don't know, when, when none of that came to plant pan out, it was like, oh, maybe I'm just a pervert. Damn. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, who were your least favorite? My least favorite by far, and it and it sounds like it's a really strong opinion. It's not that strong of an opinion, but if I had to rank them all, it's really tough, like top mm-hmm. to bottom. Like I'll, I can go between Drac being my favorite, Jal being my favorite. Um, at times, even though Korra has some serious weaknesses, sometimes I you know, the strong parts of her character go up really high on the list for me. Um, I can go all across the board of like how the ones that I like, but universally at the bottom of the list is always Kalo. <laughs> um, and it's, it's not that he's terrible, but I, in my, it's really, it's a really unfair thing that I tell other people not to do in comparing to the original trilogy, mm-hmm. but Joker is your pilot on the Normandy. Do you know what I mean? Like Joker yeah. is your pilot on the Normandy and Callow is your pilot on the Tempest and it's not even close. It's an unfair comparison, yeah. but it's like light years apart between Joker and Callow. 
I think Kala's biggest problem is that, like, his main thing was just fighting with Gil. I can't really name much about Kalo except that he built the ship, he was attached to the ship, and he hates Gil. Like, that's... Like, a Joker, I can say a whole bunch of stuff on. Like, he had a crush on Edie. Uh, he has that weird bone disease. I don't know what it is. He, like, makes jokes. He has a hat. Like, you know, there's all sorts of stuff I can, like, say with his character. But Kalo, not so much. And I think... That's just a problem with the game that sometimes they didn't really have enough time to like invest in their stories. Yeah, and in Kalos, unfortunately, he's entirely one dimensional. I mean, there's there, he loves he loves the Tempest so much he should you know weld himself into the Tempest, like that one piece of equipment that got stuck in there. They should just tie him to the seat. Um, <laughs> but Kalo is one dimensional, whereas Joker, like you mentioned, the uh, the Rolex syndrome, the the brittle bone disease that he has. Um, mm-hmm. that's an amazing scene. I, I think it might be in Mass Effect 1 when you first get to ask him about it. And, you know, he talks about how the fact, like, it doesn't define him. Like, he's a great pilot. And when he's in that pilot's chair, he's the best damn pilot in the Alliance fleet. And that's it. And that's all that matters. I mean, Bioware, yeah. can, Bioware can be praised for a bunch of different diversity depictions and showing people who are in marginalized groups. But I think one of the most, one of the least talked about is people who maybe have a condition or an illness in that sense. And yet he's not just getting by, he's the best damn pilot in the best human pilot, at least in the galaxy. And his, his disease means nothing to that. So, I mean, Joker is like one of my favorite characters of all time. It's really unfair to Kalo that his, his only, his only uh, aspect of note is he really, really likes the ship. (laughs) Yeah. So like it. He really did need that, I like flying because of this reason. Like, I don't know, maybe my dad taught me or something lame like that. But he really needed that, like, connection more than I built ship. I like ship, happy face, you know? Well, you know what's interesting when you mentioned that? It made me think that, like, he's he is somewhat um, free. He's kind of free-spirited for a Solarian. Not to say that all Solarians are buttoned down. But I mm-hmm. liked, with Morden, what I really liked is that yeah, he's super analytical. He's super scientific, but like he kind of goes with his gut. He's very sure of his his emo. He's very open with his emotions. Also, um, mm-hmm. I think that would have been a better way to write Callow. Is like if they if they actually showed that he had some friction maybe with other Solarians because like he wants a life of adventure and flying ships and not necessarily being in a lab kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was kind of a missed opportunity. But um, okay, so the, to the topic overall of like the fact that the characters are young, I had a thought on this, and it's actually something mm-hmm. that somebody left a comment um, on my most recent video that I did. Uh, and I, I specifically, in my video, I was I was kind of talking about sort of the way our perspectives change as we get older, etc. Yeah, thought, I saw it. And I thought it was really interesting. Uh, people can check it out. It's called Our, our Bioware Fans, Have Bioware Fans Outgrown Bioware Games. I thought it was really interesting. A couple of commenters actually noted that they are... Um, a little bit older. I don't know if they gave their age. I think one of them said he's over 50. Uh, I assume it's a he. Oh, they, wow. they said they're over 50. And, you know, I feel like I have changed as I've gotten older. This one commenter said something that I thought was really interesting. He's like, well, I liked the fact I'm, I'm much older than, than Ryder and, and the characters. He goes, but I liked the fact that they were younger. It, co- it sort of allowed me to empathize with him in a different way. And I felt mm-hmm. the same way. I mean, I guess Ryder in canon is supposed to be 22 years old, which is really young. Wow, yeah. Uh, I'm young. I'm like, I mean, I'm 27, and I'm so I'm still a little bit older than that. And, and that's old enough to look at some of the actions and go, yeah, that's not what I would do. But maybe that's there's an analog to some of the things that I've done. Uh, and so when I kind of like keyed into Ryder, especially and some of the other characters, um, I empathized with them in a different way. It, and it actually, I actually found them very endearing because even though it is frustrating to have your team, there's a scene um, early on in the game where the crew of the Tempest basically walks out on you in a meeting. And I've heard many people get upset because there's really no dialogue option that allows you to kind of like take control and not let that happen. Um, mm-hmm. the best one I think is like you select a professional option and, and Vetra says like, oh, okay, thanks. But they all still walk off without you dismissing them. And that is frustrating if you're trying to role play writer as an older sort of more in control character. But I actually think that that's a very realistic thing to happen. Uh, and something that I can personally relate to if you've ever been really young and sort of in a leadership situation with older, more experienced people, um, mm-hmm. That will ha- that will happen to you, just to the best of people, to the most to the brightest and most talented of young people. That will totally happen to you if you're dealing with older, more experienced people. So, I don't know. When I keyed myself into the younger characters, Liam and Ryder, and the mistakes they make, 
it is frustrating, but I kind of think it was intentional. And I, I don't know. For me, I found it endearing that they're so young. I, I feel like, though, if they were going for that, they could have probably done it, like, a little bit better. Because I feel like something didn't really, when I was playing it, like, I got that they were young, but I didn't experience the, they're young, and, like, this is them struggling to, like, learn and, like, you know, do this for the first time kind of thing. It was more just the frustration of being able to be like, okay, but no, that's a really, but don't lick the rock, Suvi. <laughs> 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 you know, you know something like that. Like, it. It just didn't come across to me like that, I guess. Yeah, licking rocks is not 22-year-old behavior. That's like four-year-old behavior. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It like, I don't know why I'm so stuck on the licking rock thing. So I think <laughs> at the time, like, I'm listening to this and my mouth is, like, wide open. Like, are you see- You are a scientist. You know what this will do to you. There's even a line where Lexi tells you not to do it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Her face <laughs> swells up, right? Like, a lot of bad stuff happens because she licks rocks. Yeah it's that's that's the whole thing but like um even with liam like doing all this like back dealing and like uh stuff with the angar and then it turns out you know goes south kind of thing but it, it's uh, ah <laughs> ah why would you do that <laughs> it's, it, it seems like um it's not consistent right i would agree with that like you're saying they could have mm-hmm. done that 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 angle that i talked about better because it's not consistent right it's it's not consistent and like I just it, it, I, it to me it came off cro- across more like unprofessional not even that but like the way the game played I felt like it wasn't it was like all over the place I guess is what I'm trying to say I felt like they were trying to do X and they were if, like what they were trying to do what you want to do it's completely different am I making sense right now I don't think I am <laughs> well no I, I think you're making sense and like sometimes I felt like the the one dialogue option that I'm even though in my current playthrough, um, which is also being uploaded in 4K, if anybody wants to check it out on the channel, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of role playing writer a little more, a little more free spirited, a little more casual, uh, a little mm-hmm. more humorous. Whereas in my initial playthrough, it was almost always um, logical and professional. Mm-hmm. Um, even when I'm, even when I'm kind of trying to go for the casual and informal options, I'm like, well, that's not, that's not funny, or like that's not what I wanted. Like it's just kind of awkward. Uh, I'm, I'm more. I actually felt satisfied if you just consistently keep going to the professional option and to the technical option. I think writer, writer at least, kind of does come off slightly older, kind of bumping it up into the late 20s, closer to 30 type behavior. I think you can be mm-hmm. – what I find frustrating is like trying to role play him as a 22-year-old. He starts to come off as like a 16-year-old. Like some of the, some of the casual options okay. are just dumb. And I'm like, I, this is kind of it's kind of harder to role play writer as being funny or casual because they're just some of those lines are not well written. I wonder if maybe that's my problem because I was playing the casual options. Yeah, I feel like the casual so. options or the, the the heart option, the emotional options, not bad. Um, but mm-hmm. the, I don't know what you call it, the swirl, <laughs> that icon, the, <laughs> that one's not, I, I find it to be the least satisfying. So I kind of hear what you're saying. You select the option wanting to be kind of witty and he just comes off kind of cringe. Which like, if they wanted to go that route, I don't think would have been a bad idea, but because I don't think it was intentional, it did come off, yeah, really, really cringy and just really bad. I think like everyone wanted the purple hawk option where like it was really hilarious, and maybe like a little bit too mean. But it wasn't. It was the cringe 16-year-old, like you're saying. Yeah, Hawk had awesome bite on on the humorous oh, ones. Like, it was so fun to play a sarcastic Hawk. And I think that's what everyone wanted, and it just it wasn't there. Um, so I guess just to, to kind of uh, – one of the things that I do want to say um, on the aspect of them being young – um, is about is about Liam because Liam takes a mm-hmm. lot. Liam takes a lot of crap, um, and I will admit I've, I felt my frustrations with Liam. But I, I want to point out a couple of things on Liam that I just realized that I literally just realized on my most recent playthrough. Um, mm-hmm. In the scene after Habitat Seven, um, when Ryder is waking up in Sam Node, uh, the first thing you know when you wake up, you ask, "Is everybody else okay?" And then it cuts to the shot. Number one, cinematically, it's a great shot. I love the lighting in the shot. And Liam is sitting there on the floor and he wakes up and he's the first person to talk to you. What always really stuck out to me is the fact that Liam stayed. Like Liam was sitting on the floor. He's not in the med bay because he's hooked up to to Sam. No, there's no place to sit down. Like Liam, Mm -hmm. Liam literally sat there on the floor with you. He sits there with Ryder to, to make sure that he or she is okay. Everybody else comes back. Like everybody else left. Even, even Lexi left. Lexi's the doctor and she didn't even stay with Ryder. Liam was mm-hmm. the only one who stayed. 
And I always thought that that's like a really, it's a, like a subtle, com- hmm. completely missed, endearing moment. And it says something about Liam's character, right? Like, you reached out for him. I mean, it's not a choice the player gets to make, but Liam, get the, when the shuttle gets blasted by the lightning, Liam's about to fall out. And Ryder essentially falls out because he's trying to reach out for Liam to pull him back in. And then you both land and you you have this incredible experience like harrowing near-death experience they're both young this is their this is by far the most excitement either of them ever had and i kind of feel mm-hmm. like it's the start of a bond between Ryder uh and liam that that moment it's so subtle the only thing that that keyed me into it was like wow he's sitting on the floor like instead of just leaving because there's no place to wait like he literally said no i'm gonna wait here until Ryder wakes up i thought that i think that that says something um kind of tremendous about about liam's character it would have been interesting to see him like grow more as I, I really I think most of the characters that were kind of young like see them kind of grow like perhaps like um Leon's loyalty mission like they kind of went a more humorous route which like I did have fun with but perhaps like it really went south and like kind of teach him that like okay this is playing with fire and seeing him deal with that I think that would have been a much more interesting way to take that. Um, so no, I think you're right about that as far as like, they don't grow and that is frustrating because though the thing that would be so satisfying, like you just said earlier with younger characters is like, okay, they start off in that really young place. And then especially if it's because of writer's choices, like you get to, you get to make writer mature. And then as Mm -hmm. the leader, you help your friends mature. Um, yeah, that's what's so great about Garrus. I mean, Garrus in Mass Effect One, you get to do that yeah. directly, and it's such a huge impact. Uh, Liara throughout the series does the same thing. Um, Tally too, I would say. Oh, Tally in a huge way. You're right. She's maybe the most um, mm. that grows. Uh, but then, it, so real quick, the second point in my defense of Liam is I know a lot of a lot of people say he's selfish. Like a lot of people make the the comment that he's selfish, and the one thing that a lot of them mention is when he is. Um, when he when he sort of goes across, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, starts to talk to people in the Angara community unofficially, unsanctioned, and starts to share information between the Initiative uh, and the Angara, and that's totally a mistake, right? That's totally not professional, un- unofficial, unsanctioned. He totally shouldn't do it, but I always see it as like he has such a good heart. Like he really, really means well, and he's so frustrated with bureaucracy, and the way he sees it is like, look, it's a risk, but if we don't trust them, they're never going to trust us. And look what happened between them and the cat and between us and the cat and between all of the species in the Milky Way galaxy. Like, we don't get to do introductions again. This is the first, these are really crucial moments between two different societies. If somebody doesn't kind of expose themselves to risk, we'll never get to do it. Logically, it's a mistake. Like, it's a bad move. But his intentions, his emotional sort of through line is like really genuine and like he just cares about people. So I never liked the criticism uh, that Liam is selfish. I just think he's, you know, he doesn't give a lot of forethought to like better alternatives or more logical alternatives. But again, that instance is to me is like, wow, he knows if he gets caught, he was going to be in huge trouble. And he did it anyway, not to be rebellious, but because he thinks that, you know, he thinks he's helping two societies come together. I agree with that. Like, I I never really got the feel that he was selfish, just like you said. Didn't think through his actions. <laughs> so, I, I, and like, pretty much everything he did was just trying to bring people together. That was his whole story arc, I feel like. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So, so yeah, so I think, like you said, characters, um, overall, they are younger. And it seems like we both agree that they could have done the younger, the youngness of them better. Um, mm-hmm. even if that angle does have its own strengths as far as how you can relate to them being young, they could have been more consistent with it. Um, and, I, and I think we're in a 100% agreement that Suvi should not be licking rocks. Yeah, no, I don't know why they did that. <laughs> like, I thought the religious angle for scientists was a really interesting angle because, like, I like I work in the mental health agent like agency. I have met kids who have become super super religious in rebelling against their like agnostic or Wiccan or like pagan parents. <laughs> yeah. So like, I this is a real thing, and I really like that kind of representation for that. But but like. The, the the I think they added too much to her character, like the super super awkwardness. Like, oh god, have you ever seen her romance at all? Uh, no, I have not. 
it is so cringy. I can't handle it. Oh my god. <laughs> I I try I, I like watching through all the romances to see like, oh maybe who do I want to romance or whatever. I looked through Suvi's and I could not finish it. It was so cringy. I couldn't handle it. Um but uh I, I think if they just made her like kind of confident and then maybe like a little bit shy about like her religion or her beliefs or something like that, that would have been like a good basis. But I think they just threw much into her and especially with that stupid rock thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. And so um, I don't, I don't want to stay too long on characters, but at the same time, I kind of mm-hmm. feel like it's a Bioware game. Like characters are the things that people end up debating the most anyway. Yeah. Um, so just so what, one other thing, because you mentioned Suvi's romance. And I did want to say this earlier, because like like Liam, I end up defending Korra a lot because um, I feel like she got a lot of flack and she has nice moments. I guess what I really like about her is I, I know a couple of people in real life who kind of get that same rap as being really like they're super professional. They're certain, but they're really buttoned down. But when you get to know them, they've got like this sweet side or this this more uh, personable side. And I always find, I don't know, I like I have a soft spot for those people because um, they so often get typecast as like, oh, this person is too stiff, they're too uptight, and you don't people don't never give them a chance. But all my defensive core aside, the one criticism that I think is really true is her. On, on the arc for her romance, especially early on, it's really uneven. Like I thought of what you said about how like maybe she had a crush on Alec Ryder or something to that effect. Because mm-hmm. when you when you initially start to choose the flirt options with Cora, it's like really uneven. Like she just it's like immediate. It's not even like flirting. She kind of comes on super strong, and then Ryder also kind of comes on super strong. Like right from mm-hmm. the first time you choose one of the flirt options, um, I always thought that that was really uneven for her. I thought, so I guess switching to romances now, I really liked, look, looking through all of them, I really liked Reyes and Jal. I thought they had p- probably the better romances in the game. Yeah, I haven't done Jal's, but I've seen it. I watched a video of it. That seems, yeah, I, that seems mm-hmm. um, seems pretty classy, you know, in, in fitting with Jal and really earnest as well. Mm-hmm. It, it really felt like kind of, you actually romance him really, really late in the game. Um, pr- pretty much when you meet him, it's all friendship, friendship, friendship. And then after you save the Moshi, then you can start like actually giving those flirt options. And it, it kind of did feel like we're friends, we're getting to know each other. And oh, look, we fell in love. I thought that was like a really nice little arc. And then with Reyes, he's just so suave. Ooh. <laughs> he is. I, know I wish he was a squad mate. I think he would have been a really cool squad mate member. No, he would have been he would have been great, and I mean we'll we'll talk about this later, is like whether or not anything will will happen with the with the sequel. But mm-hmm. it would be awesome if if there were a sequel that Reyes makes that he gets promoted uh, to full squad mate. That would be I'm sure people would go nuts because he's such a liked character. Um, even just even from the non romance standpoint, like it's still kind of like a cool. It, it, he works great. He works great as a romance option, and then even mm-hmm. as just like a friendship option when you're sitting on top of the building over overlooking Kadara Port having that drink. Having the whiskey in the morning. Yeah, That's that moment, moment was so earnest. I really liked that. I think that was one of the moments, like in the game. I'm like, oh shit, I'm having fun right now. <laughs> it, so, um, I think, uh, to, so we we spent like a lot of time on characters. So, what I want to talk about now is, is Mass Effect Andromeda a Mass Effect game? That is, it's a really interesting uh, question, and I'm gonna say absolutely it is. It's just that. I don't know. I would take I would take the position of Mass Effect Andromeda similar to the position I took on The Force Awakens in that mm-hmm. it's absolutely Star Wars and it's absolutely Mass Effect except it lacks it lacks what feels like the spontaneity of the earlier instances in those respective franchises because to me Mass Effect Andromeda although it does do some things differently that maybe people liked or didn't like I think the biggest flaw that Mass Effect Andromeda has is it's it's trying to do Mass Effect by formula in a lot of instances, and so I mm. think it falls flat. So I think it is an absolutely a, a, a true Mass Effect game. Um, it's just I think it's maybe a little too derivative. I like have the opposite opinion because I feel like if they just released this on its own standalone, it probably would have done a little bit better than the people who really wanted a Mass Effect game and then got Andromeda. I think that what I remember of the original series, it was kind of like dark and gritty and got really, really serious at times. And it was like a struggle, like playing those games. I felt like I am struggling, like my character is struggling through this. And then in Andromeda, it was like, oh, let's, you know, gather up the gang and have a good old time. You know, like that's just how I felt. I felt like there wasn't a lot of 
similar themes in the two. So people that were fans of the original series, like, I don't think they would like Andromeda. So I, I totally get where all this drama is coming from. It's really interesting as you say that because I don't I don't disagree. I know I just said I know uh, I just said the complete opposite of what of what you said, but at the same time like I can't disagree with you, right? Like if you look at the beginning mm-hmm. of Mass Effect 1, I almost wish that we could get I know some people are not a fan of this cuz it would take a lot of resources and it would be like developing a new game, but if we did mm-hmm. get like a complete remake of Mass Effect trilogy in Frostbite, like if you gave it up mm-hmm. because like if you I if you look at the technology available, like I don't think that they they were able to fully show uh, what happened uh, on Eden Prime, right? Eden Prime is a devastating, horrific attack on one of the most promising human settlements in the galaxy in the Traverse, and that's how the game starts. The game starts with this like cataclysmic level event, this terrible disaster where specters are getting killed and human you know, Shepard almost dies. There's a rogue specter. Nobody believes you at the council in the Citadel. You're right. It's really dark. It's really like, we're going to give you a ship, but you're one lone ship. And yeah, you're the first human specter, but nobody believes in you. Everybody thinks, everybody thinks that Saren is innocent. It's a very dire situation to start off in. Whereas when you board the Tempest for the first time, it's like hope, opportunity, just like you said, like, let's get the gang together. I can see how those things are actually the right. They're polar opposites. Yeah, which I would I think if they just like change the character models of like the the different aliens minus the the Agarin because they're new, but this could have been a whole new thing and people would have been okay with it. Now, uh, granted, it would have had sold as many units because it didn't have Mass Effect in the title, probably not. So I get what they're doing, but it just isn't a Mass Effect game in my eyes. Like I so I can't. I totally get why people don't like this game who are fans of the original Mass Effect. That being said, I, I do I did have fun with the game. They're two completely different things, but I did have fun with it. There's so many flaws. I think a lot of the story, the cat, I don't think they were intimidating at all, personally. Um, like, a- after we destroyed the Exaltation Center, I was like, all right, they're not that bad. Okay. So, I, and a lot of the choices, I think, were really hollow, like, like in Mass Effect, like, there's so many choices where you're just sitting there like, oh my god, what do I do? Like, with the Geth or um, with uh, the, the choice on Eden Prime. Like, do you sacrifice Caden or Ashley? There was nothing like that in Andromeda. Yeah, on Vermeer, right? So for Caden. Yeah, oh, sorry, Vermeer, yeah. Um, that's actually so, it's funny that you mentioned that kind of, kind of um, with a callback to, to your feelings about the characters and wanting to punch them in the face. Mm-hmm. Somebody left a great comment uh, on, on, the, on the video that I did where they said they hated all the characters and they said that they didn't like, um, how, did, how did they phrase this? They said, you know, with, with Mass Effect 1, like I, I really had to struggle over, like, do I leave behind Caden or do I leave behind Ashley? And if this was if it was the same situation with Andromeda, I would have left the entire crew of the Tempest on Vermeer. <laughs> Like, yeah see <laughs> even as someone who loved the tempest crew i laughed i literally laughed out loud when i read that comment and i said you know what i love the characters but that was really funny mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but i like the mass effect characters the original series like i would also choose them over having played in drama like i really like joel and reyes and all of them but i would choose tally garris or whatever now maybe that's because i spent three games with them perhaps but it's I I don't know I just coming away from the game I just didn't have that sense of connection to the crew like I did like after like any of the Dragon Age games or like the original series like I just kind of felt like it, it's like that friend at school when you're at school you like hanging out with them but like you're not going to invite them over to your house and go hang out with them because oh. like you can always stand there for about eight hours of the day <laughs> it's work friends it's work friends is that what you're saying it's work friend they yeah, Andromeda was, like, my work friends, and then I'm going to go, like, have a couple drinks with, like, the original series, you know? Interesting. Some of my best friends are work friends. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe that's what it is, right? That's that's our difference on, on, the, on the characters. No, um, so I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to keep coming back to characters, but in a way that I do. But hang on, mm-hmm. let me, let's stay on, because I thought you said something really interesting about choices. Okay. Okay. That's a massive that's a massive topic for me because I, w- I was kind of thinking in my head, well, like, no, it is a Mass Effect game because you have this crew of people and, like, you're building relationships with your squad mates and, like, that's inherently Mass Effect, right? And then I thought, well, no, that's inherently Bioware. You do that in Dragon Age too. 
Mm. You do that in the Dragon Age franchise, so it's not inherently Mass Effect. It's, in, it's it is definitely a Bioware game because there's you know there's, there's there's a squad of people that you build relationships with, and there's somewhat branching storylines and all this you know staples of Bioware RPGs. But is it a Mass Effect game without those really gut wrenching choices? And I, th- I think you're right. I think the fact that the choices felt hollow, I think that it's sort of like the progression of a trend that had been happening uh, mm-hmm. throughout the series. I mean, obviously, let's not even touch the ending of Mass Effect 3, but it's true, it's true, it's true that towards towards Mass Effect 3. You know, we never had another choice that was, in my opinion, as definitive as Caden or Ashley um, mm. to the point where, you know, they're basically not in Mass Effect 2. And then I'm sure it required a ton of extra work to make that decision work out in Mass Effect 3. And then you have certain players who, you know, if you ever look at the statistics of people who don't finish a game that they play, very few players as a part of a whole play a game twice and it's like less than 3% of players who ever do 100% of content or something like that. I think it might be less than 1%. I can't remember what the statistic was. Oh, wow. It's drastically low. So I think that that trend happened with Bioware because they're like, look, it's cool for the players that want to explore every single potential possibility. But we're doing a ton of work and we're paying voice actors and we're doing all this writing. And maybe we shouldn't make these huge branches because... Most people like the feeling of having a choice and they don't really tend to notice that the choice is kind of like, eh, you made a choice, but it all kind of ends up the same. But I would argue that um, what so I would say the Inquisition also had this problem, but they did it like a little bit better versus Andromeda where I felt like it literally did nothing. Kill the AI, keep the AI, like, okay, what's the difference? Sloan or Reyes, okay, what's the difference? Exile or release Nilkin, okay, what's the difference? Like, I didn't feel like there was any difference at all. I think the only thing that maybe affected the game was if you destroyed the exaltation faculty, goodness, exaltation facility, if you destroyed it or kept it, and then maybe the Krogan Scouts versus the Slarian Pathfinder. Like, two choices out of the entire game Oh, that's a very small amount of a game that's supposed to be about choices. Yeah, no, I I, I agree with you that the choices um, they're not as good. I mean, I think mm-hmm. I think that's kind of like that's kind of Bioware's mentality. What what I what I said earlier about like they're trying to save resources and maybe they feel like mm-hmm. you know there's that small section of players who love the fact that there's these huge meaningful choices that separate into very distinct branches, but that number of people just isn't high enough to justify the resources. Like it doesn't equate to sales being that much larger or smaller. Um, Mm -hmm. But I definitely agree with you that, I mean, personally, I am one of those players who plays through it multiple times and I love to see like major branching storylines. So yeah, I agree with you. I think, I think that the choices in Andromeda are not nearly as, they're not nearly as gut wrenching and they're not nearly as gut wrenching because they don't have as big of an impact um, mm-hmm. And they also they're also not set up nearly as well. Um, so like one of the big one of the ones that I agree with you on that does have a significant choice is between the Salarian Pathfinder and the Krogan Scouts. The problem with that is you don't know that these Krogan Scouts exist, but 15 minutes before you have to make the choice. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I, were there Krogan Scouts? I don't know. I, I also was really confused. And maybe you know. So when you're choosing between the Krogan Scouts and the Slarian Pathfinder, I thought that there was more people with the Slarian Pathfinder. I I think it just ended up being just her, but I thought it was her and then a bunch of people versus Krogan Scouts. Uh, no, there are more people with Reka. Um, it's not okay. it's not just, but it's a handful, and it's and it's even worse. It's more reductive because it's like, well, these other people don't really count. They're just with her. <laughs> yeah. So like, if when I when I was like choosing I, I got really confused like okay is it just her if it's just her i'm going to c- pick the scouts or is it her with a bunch of people if it's her with a bunch of people then i'm going to choose her i i eventually came to the conclusion where i thought it was just her so i picked the Krogan scouts but then like oh and the other people died i'm like so there were other people what <laughs> what happened yeah and if i and if i remember correctly they're the ones who are also kind of like helping you they're they're the ones who are not really combat people but you kind of run mm. into them in the facility i don't know if i'm mixing that up with another mission I no, they're there. I just don't. I don't know. Like the whole thing, like I don't think it was explained very well. And then yeah, the Krogan Scouts. You find out about them like not fifteen minutes beforehand. 
So like, and I and I think a lot of that sort of stuff where like um, like the AI versus keep the AI. Like okay, who the, who cares about an AI? Like just to kill it. I don't care what happens to it afterwards. So. Yeah. yeah, the AI pick I thought was really um, unsatisfying only because from the basis of what that is, the kernel of that within the story, that could be so interesting. It could be so amazing to have this ancient alien yeah. AI. And what do they do? They stick it next to Sam and there's like a couple of dialogue options. Yeah, like they could have easily had something as simple as you gain some um, like new weapons. You know, like you get access to like the level 10 uh, Angar and weapons like that could have been it. Just like something f- tangible that we could have done, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. And then uh, so kind of going back to like the, the meaningful picks that that matter. Krogan Scouts uh, versus Salarian Pathfinder. And then the reason why I feel like that obviously has the most impact of any of them is because it feeds into um, the second most impactful pick, which is the pick for Ambassador. Um, because Rika yeah. is not available, obviously, if she doesn't make it out of there. And that's always been my, my favorite choice, um, especially mm-hmm. because if you read her codex entry, it says that she worked with the Salarian Dalatros at, at that time when she was kind of coming up. So she's like specifically trained for politics, not just not just exploration, not just science, not just combat, but also politics. And it mentions that she was kind of slated for politics because everyone found her to be a really charismatic and inspiring leader. Um, mm-hmm. So I think kind of, like I, when I read that in her codex entry, I'm like, oh, well, there's no there's no other choice, even even though I kind of begrudgingly didn't want to give Tan what he wanted. It's like, yeah. no, I mean, I don't like Tan, but logically she's the right choice. I so my biggest problem with the choice of ambassador is ambassador for what? It's not clear. Like I got, it's not. I was it. Is it the ambassador to like the next? It's not. It's not the next. Is it the nexus? No. What's the the arcs? The giant hyper. Fuck. What is it? Uh, the giant space station thing. Just just the initiative in general. Yeah, the nexus. Yeah. Is it ambassador for the initiative to the people of the Helios cluster, or is it ambassador of the Helios cluster to the initiative? Because in if it's the Helios to the initiative, then Moshe Sefa would make sense because she's from there. But if it's from the initiative to the rest of the the, you know, the Helios, then like, anyone else could choose it. But like when when I chose it, I chose Bradley because I th- I thought it was the space station to the Helios cluster. But then like the way they were talking about it, I'm like, oh shit, did I just hire this random human dude who's been like in the Andromeda for like a year to represent Andromeda. Like, is that just, is that just what I did? What does this mean? What did I just do? That, that was my reaction. I thought it was really unsatisfying. The idea that like, wait a minute, writer just what picked the leader for the entire cluster for, I, I yeah. guess like if, if, if everyone together, the, the Angara and the, the exiles and the initiative all explore beyond the Helios cluster this person is going to be like the leader for the whole thing. Like that doesn't make any sense. And yeah, you're right. I thought, I thought of it the way you thought of it, which is like, this is the ambassador between the initiative and the exiles and the, the Helios cluster as a whole. So it was really frustrating to me to find out that Moshe Isefa was mad at me. Cause I figured like, well, you're already the leader of your people. So how would you do both? I kind of figured you're going to continue to be kind of like one of the leaders along with um, Perrin Shi and uh, the leader Mm -hmm. of the Angara resistance. And and our ambassador will interface with you. You'll be like equals with them anyway. So I I didn't understand why she was mad at me. I did think that that pick needed to be explained a lot better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So now what do you think? One one thing that I really felt like is a lot of the choices – were just trying to set up whatever the next game would be. So it, do you think they're going to have another game? No. I, 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 re- yeah. I really don't think, and it, it, it pains me to say that, I do not think that there will be a direct sequel to Andromeda. I think every indication, now kind of getting into the, to the business analysis of this, I think every indication, uh, every sign points to EA saying this was a failed, this was a failed endeavor. And we're going to take a break. We're going to, you know, reassess where our resources are going. They've clearly dispersed the developer team that was at Bioware Montreal into EA Motive and back into Edmonton, back into Austin. 
Uh, there's there hasn't been any reports that anyone was let go. It just seems like they've they've kind of reassigned people to different work. So it looks like hey, they've, they've, we've got a lot of um, obviously tons of resources going towards Anthem, tons of resources going towards Dragon Age Four. There's supposedly still some type of Star Wars game that's not the Old Republic being developed at Bioware Austin, and then they're still mm-hmm. developing and supporting the Old Republic. Um, so that it, it really does and there, where's the pipeline like where is the resources to make another Mass Effect game it doesn't even look like they're going to start until Anthem comes out uh, and probably not even after that because they're going to start developing DLC for that and then same thing with same thing with um, Dragon Age 4 so we know Edmonton's like the super studio they've got two separate main A teams I guess you could call it they're busy so I don't think we have a Mass Effect Andromeda sequel anytime soon I, I would agree and I think it's a little bit of a shame because I, I have the feeling, so I, I got like a really Dragon Age 2 feel from this game where like there is some heart here and perhaps in a series of things it could like, you know, stand on its own. But on as its own, Mass Effect and Drama, I don't think really has legs to be something memorable. But I, if there was like a second one that and they could like be together, then perhaps it would be okay. But on its own, I don't think this is going to be a game that people are going to remember, which is kind of sad. So, yeah, I think that's my opinion. Yeah, I think Dragon Age 2 is a great comparison. Um, mm-hmm. Dragon Age 2 is a there's a question of like writer, right? Like to me, writer feels exactly like Hawk felt. I love Hawk. I wish Dragon mm-hmm. Age 2 had done better. I wish Hawk, I wish Hawk would have continued. I wish Hawk would have been the um, the Inquisitor. I, as much as I like my Dwarven and Elven. Uh, Inquisitors. I liked Hawk a lot, and I liked Ryder a lot. Like I said, I feel Ryder's a better protagonist than Shepard, um, mm-hmm. but I don't think we're ever going to see Ryder again, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Which, like, I kind of I, another question I wanted to ask: If there was another Mass Effect two, would you want to see Ryder again or have a new face? I kind of like the Dragon Age; you get a new person every time, and then like the other like maybe old protagonists come in and say like, "Hey, what's up? All right, I'm leaving." I like that much better than like your Shepherd every time. So I wouldn't mind a new character other than Ryder. I think Ryder, like, I'm okay. Like, okay, Ryder and whoever her romance or his romance was go off into the sunset, have a good time, they're done. And then, like, your new fresh face dude could go off and have a fun adventure. I think that'd be great. I, I well, okay, so I will say, yeah, I love Ryder. I'm attached to Ryder. That's great. What would, would you, what I agree with you on is that, and I, by the way, I think this is the only way that they can continue the, the franchise. I don't think you can go. I don't want a prequel. I don't want to do the first Contact War. I know some people do. To me, that's not interesting. Yeah. yeah. And you can't sequelize Mass Effect 3 because the choices are just too massive, especially with the indie, and there's no way to work all of that in. You have to you mm-hmm. have to continue in Andromeda. And to me, the way to do that is, like you said, new character, and they have left the Helios Cluster. You know, yeah. so like I say, maybe it's years down the road or maybe it's right after Mass Effect Andromeda, but it's like a lone team that kind of maybe splits off from the initiative. They go into another cluster of the Andromeda galaxy. You can do whole new species. You can maybe still do some cat, maybe still do Angara, do whatever you want, but you can have a complete clean break from Andromeda. And I think that would be best served by a completely new protagonist. So I agree on that for sure. Yeah. I like there are things I want to figure out with Andromeda, like some explanation of like what the Jardan was and their connection to the Angara. Um, what about like what what is up with the Ket? What what's going on there? Like I I felt like the very last I'm gonna say like hour of the game gave you a lot of like or what was my last hour of the game I guess because you could do a whole bunch of stuff, but um, gave you a lot of like questions. I'm like oh these would have been really really cool to know earlier in the game. So I can kind of, like, think about it and, like, maybe some more hints of... Like, they need to set up, I guess, the Helios Cluster lore a little bit more. It would be interesting to see if, like, um, if they do any DLC, will any more of these questions be popped up? Like, I know that everyone wants the Corians to come in and stuff like that, but, like, it, maybe, like, if they have two DLC, one is about the Corians to do whatever, and maybe, like, one just to, like, tie up some loose ends. I don't know. That would be interesting. Like, oh, here is all the choices that you made. And here in like a quick five minute sentence, you're going to tell you like how it happened with that. Almost kind of like in a trespasser way, because like in trespasser, like you did see a lot of like the effects of your choices kind of come to light a little bit. And it, and it's it's super um, it's super satisfying, too. I mean, I think 
Tres- Trespasser yeah. was super satisfying, and the Citadel DLC for a lot of people was super satisfying in Mass Effect, and it just kind of sucks that it kind of feels like Andromeda is not going to get that same treatment. And then also, I mean, you mentioned Quarians. I mean, that was like such an obvious foreshadow in the epilogue oh, yeah. of Andromeda, and everyone's like, well, I mean, guaranteed, guaranteed, we're going to see Quarians. It's going to be the first DLC, and now it looks like DLC is not being worked on, and it's like, wow, they left that hanging expecting that they were going to get to do it in DLC and now nada, you know? Yeah. Now, how long did it take? Okay. So, um, Inquisition was released in November, like late November. When did Jaws of Hackon come out? Cause that was the first DLC. So like, is it already pretty much past time where like, if there was DLC, it would have been announced done by now. Let's see. This game was released in March and it's what now? June. It was March, right? Yeah, so it's been almost exactly three months. Yeah, so let's see, three months from November would be like, I think it was re- like, released in like February or March. So yeah, we which we probably should be hearing something pretty soon if they're going to do anything at all. Are going to be my thoughts? Yeah, I didn't. Uh, so if, like, I didn't realize it was that quick, but you're totally right because even like Trespasser was within a year, wasn't it? Yep. Yep. It it was it was uh it was September. Uh, like 9th or something like that. I got really excited, so, so I remember the date. Oh. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was uh, September 9th, or, like, you know, like, about a year after the game came out. So, like, it, if we don't get anything by, I'm going to say, you know, March 2018, like, there's not going to be anything, obviously. So we're, we're kind of on a tipping, ticking time clock here. Yeah, no, I agree. And so, um, so I guess, right, so the overall question, right, is, like, was... Was Mass Effect Andromeda a success or did it fail? I think that it failed overall. No, I had fun with it. And I I think there's two different questions. Is it fun? I think it's fun. Did it fail as a Bioware game? Yes, it did. That's going to be my opinion on it. You know, my, my opinion has changed because for as much as I loved it, I, um, I, it's just actually funny just not to tell the story completely, but I said, I, I proclaimed in a particular video uh, that they failed, that it was a failure. Mm -hmm. And I I guess at some point that's how I felt. And when I really thought about like that term of like, it's a, it's a total failure. It's a complete failure. Long story short, I debated it a lot and I ended up like editing it out of, out of a particular video before I posted it. Cause I just, I Mm -hmm. couldn't, I didn't feel like I personally could mount that argument successfully and at, at one point I thought, yes, it's a failure because point blank, if you ask the people at Bioware Montreal, do they feel that they succeeded at realizing their vision? I'm sure that they would probably say no. You know, They would probably yeah. say, we wanted this to be so much better. We're proud of the hard work we put in, but man, we wanted to do this and this and this, and we just didn't succeed. So that was, that, that was kind of how I see it being a failure from that perspective. But um, I guess ever the optimist, something has occurred to me, especially after reading um, the Jason Schreier story about how rough the development cycle was and the fact that they had to restart multiple times. They didn't even know what tools they were using sometimes for the level design or for, for the 3D modeling. And, and some people were still using one tool and other people were using the other tool. I mean, it sounded so chaotic. And yet, when I play the best moments of Mass Effect Andromeda, the opening sequence, the opening scene, the scene sitting on the mm-hmm. sitting on the floor of Jal's house, or up on the mountain with Vetra, or yeah, um, the Indian, the 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 run in the Nomad on Meridian, getting ready to do the final showdown with the Archon, and like when I play the best moments of Mass Effect Andromeda, considering. The, the shitstorm that they went through in development and the fact that, like, I can't believe they finished the game. I can't believe they did anything other than complete and utter garbage. And the fact that some moments, some moments as a whole, I don't think it lives up to the trilogy, but some moments to me even surpassed um, analog moments in the trilogy, given all of the struggles that they had during development. It's kind of like maybe I'm trying too hard to be optimistic, but I just kind of feel like considering what they faced and all of the struggles they had, from that perspective, I think it's a monumental success. It's like a triumph that they managed to get these handful of great moments out of out of a development cycle that was mired with chaos and adversity. 
I I completely agree. I I think like kind of how when I look at Dragon Age two, like it has a ton of problems, but for what they did in a year, I think they did a really well. Right. Like Dragon Age two wasn't a success, but given it that they only had a year to like start and finish a game, I think they did like a great job at it. And I think and Mass Effect and Drama Andromeda is very similar to that. They were had so many problems, and like yeah, there are a lot of moments in Andromeda that like really do shine out, like that moment when you're sitting there and you're watching your father take off his mask to give it to you, and you're like, no, 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 no. I I started I don't cry at anything, and I started tearing up because it was such a dad thing to do, and it was a really good moment. And like there are those moments in Andromeda where like wow, this is a really great moment, and it, it does. Andromeda could have been something, and I think that's where the real tragedy here is. There was something there. Their team had an idea, and it was a good idea. It just they didn't have the time or the capabilities to really finish that. And I think it, in an open letter, I want to say to the devs of that team, you did the best you could, and I think that you guys should be proud of your work, even though a lot of people aren't like really fond of it because they know what it could have been, and they're angry about that. And it's not your guys' fault. I Something I see all the time that, like, kind of makes me sad, and it's, like, a little bit unprofessional, I will say, but, like, I get where they're coming from, is that a lot of the devs on Twitter will, will honestly say, like, thank you to the people who are saying, like, oh, I really like the game, I really enjoy it, because they just feel so bad about what they've done. And it's like, guys, no, like, I I get a lot of people are hating on this game, and there are some things, like, complain about, I totally get that, but for what they were able to do in such, like, chaos, as you said, it, they really were able to pull out like something presentable out of a pile of shit. And it could have been a lot better. It could have been a diamond in the rough, but like they just didn't have the means to do that. My no, I, I agree. I think, I think that's very, very well said. And like you said, it's the two sides of it are they didn't accomplish everything they wanted to. The, the parts that they did do well, like we kind of agreed on here, it's tremendous that they were able to pull it out. And then going back the other direction, that's what makes that's what makes the shortcomings even more painful to go through. Yeah. Is the fact that there's such good moments and why couldn't it be this consistent? But no, you're right. I think I think you said it correctly. Open letter to Bioware. You know, thank you for managing to pull it. Mac Walters, because apparently Mac Walters took a lot of well, not apparently, he did take a lot of crap for the ending of Mass Effect three and parts of Mass Effect mm-hmm. two that people didn't like. Uh, or not in parts of Mass Effect, everyone loved Mass Effect 2 start to finish, but parts of Mass Effect 3 that people didn't like, and apparently, according to Jason Schreier, like he's who's a big uh, force in pulling Mass Effect Andromeda together at the last moment in the last year of development, so... I guess I was just gonna, I, I know after saying all this, I can already see the comments, if if not like typed out in people's heads, like, ah, oh, well, these people are like really into Bioware and they're Bioware apologists, maybe that's true, whatever. And I think my my comment to that is that there's two things at play here. There is the company of Bioware, and then there's the people at Bioware. Did the company of Bioware make a shit game? Yes, they did. Did the people at Bioware make a shit game? I think they tried their damnedest, and I think they honestly tried to make a good game, and I'm not going to fault them for that. So I will fault Bioware for making something that could have been something bad that could have been really, really good, but I think the people, the individuals there they did the best they could and they should be proud of what they've done. That's just my opinion. That, no, that's a that's a phenomenal opinion. I can only echo that. And like, if I put my business hat on, you start at the top, all the way to the top. I mean, EA executive leadership. Mm-hmm. How did you divide up your resources? Were you approving Bioware leadership according to Jason Schreier's story, taking the taking mm-hmm. the best talent out of Bio, Bioware Montreal constantly and putting them in Edmonton to work on Anthem? You know, did you really think that that was going to work with Andromeda constantly leaving, <laughs> constantly leaving the mid-level people and taking the best talent? I mean, how did you really think that was going to work? And then Bioware leadership, were you unclear about tools that were being used or not being used? I mean, all of that stuff from a business standpoint, you have to criticize very harshly and say that's a stupid way to, to try and run your development cycle and just give that mm-hmm. honest feedback. But from the personal standpoint like the individuals who were during crunch you know apparently working weekends and working 12 hour days and putting their heart and soul into this you can't fault those people they gave it their all and they did come up with some amazing moments uh in mass effect andromeda yeah all right do you think we have an episode well I, I yeah I think that I have said my piece I I think Mass Effect and Dramana overall failed but I still have a lot of fun with it and I do eventually plan to go back when all the patches are back 
So, and which I really quick, I think that what they're doing, the patches are like really good so far. So I'm really excited to see like what happens, what the game looks like and revisit it for the first time since release. So after all the patches have come. Yeah, real quick, I'll say I'm playing on 1.08. I've got about 15 mods installed, which are fantastic. Um, So I would definitely Mm -hmm. recommend getting mods and checking it out. I think the, I think the patches have got it in a really good place. Well, um, do you want to tell people where you can, they can find us? Yeah, I mean, I'm still basically eschewing all other social media. You can just find me on YouTube under Exalted March, and you know, we'll see about Twitter and stuff later on. Yeah, um, and then I'm on Twitter at Gildothalon on Twitter, and then you can PM user Gildothalon on Reddit uh, if you want to talk to me there. And I read my, you look up my YouTube channel, which is all Dragon Age lore at just Gildothalon. Um, I will want to say I had a couple of comments on uh, getting an audio version only for podcasts. Do you want to start looking towards that? Yeah, for sure. We can probably throw something up on SoundCloud. Yeah, uh, we'll try to find a way to put like an audio only version and like to those two people who make comments, I will make sure to message you saying when we do eventually have it up. Um, so thank you everyone for all the support and I think Dora Shrall. Bye.